Welcome to the Spiritual Artist Podcast. This is Chris Miller. I invite you to join me as I interview artists from a variety of disciplines. We'll share powerful stories and lessons learned while making their art. Good day. This is Chris Miller with the Spiritual Artist Podcast. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I have been doing some public speaking and recently spoke at the Visual Arts Guild of Frisco, and I do a talk on spirituality. It's a wonderful expression for me to help other artists get in touch with their spiritual side and their creative side. So it's always fun, and this was actually a surprise for me, when I meet someone else that is, uh, I guess, what you call a doppelganger or someone that is all very similar to you in another part of the country. And so I am excited to introduce uh, Jackie Fuchs today. Jackie Fuchs is a mixed media artist and gallery owner, and she currently resides between the Hamptons and Provincetown, Massachusetts, to children and adults. She owns the Art Love Gallery in Provincetown and has a successful business selling her own highly collectible art, as well as representing other artists through that gallery. But most importantly to this discussion is Jackie is a motivational speaker who facilitates spiritual talks for artists during art fairs. So when I met Jackie down here in Dallas, because she has an opening down in in, um, Frisco, we just immediately connected and started talking about the art process. So I'm excited to share spirituality and art with Jackie. Um, Good morning, Jackie. How are you? Good morning. So Jackie, um, I, I wanted to start this interview and talk a little bit about your art, because that's why people follow this channel. Uh, did you want to explain what your current uh, art is and, and how you're engaged with it, why you like it so much and share it with the listeners? Sure, Chris. Uh, well, I started off as a clay sculptor and I did that for about 35 years and uh, as a child I had a 75 cent allowance and I, and I would go to the hardware store and get nuts and bolts and put things together and take things apart and uh, make contraptions and what I was actually doing that was my early collaging because um, uh, it was always a passion to you know let, my parents were upset mostly because I would take the radios and the TVs apart and not be able to put them back together. Uh-huh. But but I really loved um, constructing things and building things. And uh, so years and years later, it led me to um, this body of work that I'm doing now, uh, which um, was very influenced by this uh, image of one of Modigliani's portraits hung above my parents' bed. And it was very disturbing to me. I, I hated looking at it because she had a long neck and no eyes. And I thought, what is going on here? This is really creepy. And, and it was always a childhood memory of uncomfortable feelings around this image. Um, fast forward, my daughter's friend invited us to Philadelphia one Thanksgiving about five years ago. I saw all the Modiglianis at the Barnes Foundation. And when I came home, I thought to myself, it it was really simple. I just thought to myself, I wonder if I can paint. Now, all along I had been, I have a degree in art from UMass. I um, became an art teacher with a master's degree from Smith and um, never taught painting. I always taught collage and clay and three-dimensional, always three-dimensional. So when I did get home from the Barnes Foundation and started to paint, I have the first painting I ever did sitting on the wall next to me. It, it was a really good painting. And I, I thought, oh, this is this looks good. And I started painting more and all my characters in all my art became uh, a, a takeoff of the long neck figures that uh, Modigliani paints. And, and because uh, I like collaging, what I do is I, I go into current fashion magazines and, and um, mid-century modern furniture magazines, and I collage stories. And from these stories and these characters, which sometimes I repeat in my imagery, 
I have put a team together of writers and TV creators, and we're we're just about uh, ready to launch and to pitch our story, the TV show. And it all stemmed from just taking a risk and going to Philadelphia with my daughter. I wasn't in the headspace to go do that. I got completely out of the hair business. I, I had hit six hair salons uh, from New York to Provincetown to the Hamptons and um, completely left that two and a half years ago. Wow. Well, you know, you said so much there. There's so much to unpack. So uh, let, let's go back to that where you talked about doing, doing, working in a hair salon, owning a hair salon. And it's so interesting how you kind of are tying that into your current art. Um, in my presentation earlier this week, I was talking about how you discover your creative DNA. And, and your creative DNA was a, a term coined by Twyla Tharp. And it talks about what is unique to you. And, and I always believe that we should discover what is truly unique to us. And so it's interesting that this Modigliani painting and then the exhibit triggered something in your creative DNA, which is the idea of fashion you know, of people getting together and mixing and mingling, but also what you were just talking about, and I'm going to grab onto that, is story, you know, trying to share a story in your painting. So tell me about that, like a, a painting that you've just recently done. Tell me about the story you envisioned with it. So it's interesting you ask that because um, I never premeditate what's going on the canvas because uh, I've learned and this is just my experiences. Um, I don't think while I'm painting, I just let it come through me. Mm. It's like giving birth. You know, I, I had a child and um, I still have her, but I, I gave birth. And the whole time I was pregnant, I kept thinking to myself, um, this is amazing. This is look, look at what my body can do. And, and, and I created this beautiful child. Um, now that happens for mostly everyone. They, they're creating a child, you know, the, it's just what our body can do. And so when I'm creating a piece of art, I have like, because someone once said to me, oh my God, you can't even tell that these are collages because you cut, the, like my magazines are cut so perfectly. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, I've been wielding a scissor with clients for 40 years. So if I can't cut a straight line, then I'm in trouble. And uh, <laughs> so um, there, there was this other influence that I would just want to bring up for a second because it was also monumental. Um, this friend of mine's mom, uh, this elderly Jewish woman who has since passed and I never met her, her, her daughter showed me her work. She's a friend of mine. She showed me her work and and I was so impressed with her freedom to express her vision. And her visions were like the Pope had an orgy going on in his head and a prostitute, you know, like on his <laughs> crown, a prostitute between his legs with fishnets and, you know, just very um, erotic um, freedom on the canvas from this 85 year old Jewish woman. Uh, and, and so that experience with the Modigliani gave me permission to um, uh, put in these stories that are on canvas uh, a few components. And her, the component that this woman gave me was that um, I started to uh, seek out and collect like 1975 Playboy magazines and, and not just put blatant images of nudes, but cut them up as the, the painting themselves on the wall in my painting, because all my walls, all my paintings have walls in them. And so I began to put nudes, current fashion, designer labels, be influenced by living in the Hamptons for 20 years, and, and, and making a commentary on a culture that, um, you know, it's all beautiful. Like I, I've been quoted in a few magazines and one magazine art uh, writer wrote, you know, Jackie's work is like a party you wish you'd been invited to. Oh, and so, it, but even the pretension in that, you know, it, it's, uh, 
it, it is a commentary on a social um, environment that, uh, you know, uh, affluent and, and like one of my pieces that I sold to Bella Abzug's daughter, Liz, was called Money Bags. You know, like a bunch of people in designer clothing with money and diamonds pouring out of their bags onto the ground and they don't care. You know, because it's it's a it's a culture of you know uh, they get whatever they want, they can have whatever they want, and and um, it so that influenced my art as well. And then mid century furniture, I've always loved, so that influenced the work. It's a play on historical art, current culture, and also some pop art that I've created with designer labels. Now, different audiences that I sell to, uh, you know, they, they it, it's, it goes over their heads. It's not, that's not the importance of the pieces. What's important about these pieces is that people identify with the objects in them. And, and I also can put people's pets in them. Like it, for me to close a deal, I'll often say, you know, do you have a pet or do you, you know, do you have children? And they'll say yes, usually. And I'll say, well, I can put them on this wall in, in this image. And that started um, because then it creates a relationship between me and the buyer. And they have this piece because no one else would have this piece because their personal loved one, whether it's a pet or a kid, is in it. Wow, that that shows one thing that you're an incredible marketer because the strategy behind that is 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 very um, smart and savvy. Um, Thank I, you. I, you're welcome. I I had people tell me because I do abstracts, as you know, and um, I've had people say, "Always throw something literal in that abstract," and I'm like, well, "What do you mean?" They go, "Well, people grab onto that, you know, like dr- include a bird or include an icon, or and and I can see what you're talking about, how it makes a a personal connection." You know, with the well, you know, it's not that um, like in regards to what you just described, uh-huh. people want like psychologically, I'm, I'm sure you probably know this, you know, people want to make sense out of abstractions, especially, you know, like if we look into the clouds, we say, oh, look, that looks like a duck, you know, or, oh, look, that looks like a bear. Like people want to, it, it's just the nature of human beings. They, they want to be able to recognize something. And once they recognize something, then they could identify whether it is or not the truth about the piece. Like when people ask me, tell me about this story, I'm like, why don't you tell me what you see? Because that's more important in the conversation that I, uh, that they tell me why they identify with it. Why are we having a conversation about this particular piece? You know, I, I also, I make mannequins. Um, Well, I don't make the mannequins. I have mannequins made for me, um, fiberglass people and animals. And, you know, people will say, oh, can you make this a bulldog? No, I don't make bulldogs. You know, this is, this is what I'm doing. And like, I'm not in the market to make what the person wants, unless it's has to do with my art. There was this client who used to come into my salon all the time and she would say, and she was a therapist and she worked with um, kids, like families with um, homes with divorced parents. So um, they, she's, she's much older than us. And so she calls it a broken home. Um, I don't wow. think that word is relevant today. I don't think it's broken. I think it's getting functional. Um, and so she used to say to me, can you make an image for me for my logo of like the two parents holding the kids pulling on both sides? I'm like, no, I'm not an illustrator, you know? And, and so like, why would you want long neck people with designer clothes and a dog in the room, you know, based on my style you, you need an illustrator and that could be done really quickly. So back to what's important is finding things 
that people identify with. Like they love like, oh, I had that couch in my image. People will say, you know, oh, I remember those telephones. And and it's it's a when when you can strike someone's memory of something positive, then it leads to um, a career that I'm having very well known, uh, you know, because also my fingerprint on my work, no one's doing what I do. So it did put me in a league that some people spend their whole life working at getting. Well, because it's important, I, it's funny, you, there's, there's a, a duality here. Um, on one hand, you, you're talking about that you design these scenes from an internal voice. And then on the other hand, you're also talking about the open-mindedness to willingly add an element or to be to include items that people recognize, which it's sort of one of those both statements. It's not an and or, it's a both. You, can, you, can you do both? Can you express your creative DNA while understanding your audience? Well, I think, you know, the point, the, the good news about that is that I have both sides of my brain. I'm, I'm a business person for the past 45 years, um, and I'm a very creative person. I'm an entrepreneur. I can, you know, I've always been able to just, I don't, it's, I never call it even taking a risk. I don't take risks. I just do it and, and put my best energy into it and then um it either works or it doesn't and i'm not married to the result i'm married to that i want to do this i want to i want to create mm. business a and i'll see what happens and you know when i first started doing art fairs i was in other people's galleries because um my work got picked up by three galleries the minute i started selling the minute i started showing um, three different galleries were like, yeah, sure. And I sold, you know, tens of thousands of dollars my first year while I was still doing hair. Um, but I don't, uh, I didn't do it like, oh, I'm going to make a living out of doing this. I just kept, I was processing a loss when this all started happening. And from this loss, I kept leaning into the pain, as they say in Buddhism, um, you know, embrace it. Don't, if you push it away, it becomes more difficult. If you lean into it, which felt like leaning into a bed of nails, um, it, it, it all passed and I healed. And, you know, there's that saying where um, the, uh, I believe it's the Chinese, they um, put, um, they pour uh, gold, into the oh. broken china i know what you're talking about mm. right yeah to fill the cracks they pull in, in in ceramics they pour gold so that's what i kept visualizing the gold being poured into what felt like a broken heart and after two years of painting i i just i healed and you know, of course, sometimes it still comes up the pain or the situation that it was, but now I have tools. Now I'm like, all you need to do is just go paint. Mm -hmm. That's the voice that comes to me. And so that's why I'm very prolific because I find so much peace and, and serenity and inner calm by being with myself and creating. I can't not create. I live in my studio. It's uh, it's a big space where if I'm walking to the bathroom, I'll stop and I'll look at the piece I'm making and I'll work on it a little and then I'll go back to sleep. Right. So it, it's a it's a process of um, knowing what you know, bringing it to the point of stories. Like what I'm telling myself is. Um, what feels better dwelling in a situation that isn't doing me any wellness or, you know, just leaning in to, oh, I'm having uncomfortable feelings today. Go paint, go take a walk, tickle your dog, call your daughter, you know, these things. Um, 
help me stay centered and, and help my story perpetuate more, more good story. So we were talking about this uh, pre-interview folks, uh, listeners, and we talked about people that if you meet an artist and they sit there and say, I'm a struggling artist, um, is, is identifying with a negative term. Whereas what you're saying, Jackie, is even though you're feel, you're, you have to feel it, you have to feel the emotions, but you can direct it into the creative process. Absolutely. And, you know, the story about the artist who says they're struggling, it's not a story that I want in my energy field. They're not, be, not, they're not bad people. They're just, they're buying into a story of struggle. And I don't struggle at all. I, um, you know, I, the, the only time I struggle is when I have decided that I'm going to keep buying into the story I'm telling myself and, and the story's not working. And so the question comes up is, you know, as an artist, I, I ask my artist who I represent, is their story working for them? Or when I do these workshops, I ask the audience, is your story working for you? Because, you know, we'll get to an art fair Everyone's put in a lot of money and there's a lot of new artists showing for the first time. And, and by the way, the first time I did an art fair without a gallery, because I knew I could do it better than they were doing it, even though we sold out my work every single show. Um, what, what I did was I put it on a credit card because I knew I was on this trajectory of success because that's the story I buy into on a daily basis about my business, any business endeavor I do. And, um, and I've had business endeavors that were not successful monetarily, but they were successful in me learning something about myself that was very invaluable and I needed those experiences. So when an artist says, oh, I'm struggling, like I don't, that's, that's not abundance, that's lack. And, and we always have a choice. Am I living in lack or am I living in abundance? Am I a fountain in the world or am I a drain? Um, you know, if I'm a struggling artist, what that tells me is, which I've never ever said, I've never struggled as an artist because that means that the person doesn't know how to get where they're going. And maybe it's just not their time in this lifetime. You know, people have said to me, oh, I've, it took me 30 years to get to where you are in your first two years. And I'm thinking to myself, I wonder what story they're telling themselves because anyone can do what I'm doing on, yeah. on one hand, you know? On That's the other wonderful. hand, they're, they're making their own story. like. I, I personally believe that everything I think of and give momentum to will manifest. So I have to be very careful because I am an expert manifester. You know, I swear to God, I, I walk, I like yesterday, I was hanging a shelf in my apartment and I thought, oh, I need one of those little things that keep the nail in place, whatever, like a plug kind of thing. And I look around and I, I find one and I, put it in. And then today, the only thing in one of my bags was one of those little things, <laughs> you know, like, I don't have to leave the Like one day I was walking my dog. I'm thinking I need a box to ship this in. And I, I go to where I walked my dog and, and there's the, the exact size of the box was there. That's how quickly I manifest. I think of it and it happens. And, and that's where the danger comes in because I can get caught up in not such a good place at times being human that happens right i so i have to make choices constantly do i want to spin in that and if i spin in that where is it taking me it's a downward spiral right you like know uh, you, you you know uh this reminds me of an early episode i did where i interviewed willene dunn and, and she talked about choosing the right words that you use I'll reference that episode in the description, but she talks about choosing the right words. And now you're taking to an even richer, a richer level, which is choosing the right story. You know, are you, are, and, and I would encourage the listeners here to sit down after this podcast and think about that. 
what story am I telling myself about my art? Not just my art, but why I do it, how I do it, and how successful it is. Um, and, and also understand, to, to that point, to understand that when you're creating, what's the story you're telling yourself? Like, um, if I'm doing a piece and I don't like it, so now I have, first of all, it takes 90 days to break a habit, it takes 90 days to create a new habit. So one of my habits is if I'm painting something and I'm not liking it, two things come to mind. One is, Jackie, you can always repaint. You can paint over it. You know, it's just canvas. You can paint over it. Or, Jackie, this might end up being your most favorite piece. And then, and, and it usually does. And then the, another story I tell myself is as I'm packing up to go to an art fair or my gallery, the last piece I create, because as I'm packing and, and getting it together and all organized, the week before it's all packed and everything's organized, I make another piece. And that's always the first piece to sell because that's the story I tell myself. The last piece I make is the first one to sell because you know I'm all packed and I'm all set and I have no expectations other than I love the work I'm putting in the show, whether it's mine or another person's. I sell other people's art as if it's mine. I put the same energy into their success as I do mine because not because their success is my success, but because their success is their success, period. I, I want artists to be successful. And that's why I created those workshops, uh, uh, how, how to navigate art fairs. And, and I was saying that, you know, you get there on a, on a Thursday, and you're all set up for the people, the VIPs to come in and you're nervous and um, everyone's you know, spent a lot of money. I put mine on a credit card the first show. And so like, you know, for an artist who considers themselves struggling, if to put $8,000 out might be their six months of rent, who knows? And so it's a big investment, but how else will an artist invest in their business if they don't invest in showing it? You know, if, if they're not going to show it in a venue that gets 10 to 40,000 people and it's going to sit in a gallery and someone's hanging it because it's their friend that owns the gallery or you're paying the gallerist to show it. I mean, that's another new model that a lot of galleries do. And and then, you, you know, if you didn't invest money to have your work put before people, then you haven't invested in your business. And so your home painting, and look, not every, most artists are not salespeople, but if I like their work, I'll do the selling, you do the creating and create in a way that knowing that it's in good hands and that the, the, the rest is not your business because, and if you don't have someone who reps you in that respect, you're in the wrong place too. You know, there's a lot of artists who just paint because um, they're making money and, and that's great if that's what they're meant to be doing. There's no judgment there. It's the same with artists who are painting and not selling. That's great too. So you have, you know, 200 paintings in your studio and you don't want to sell it, that, that's, that, that's perfectly okay, but don't call yourself a struggling artist. You're painting. If you're painting, what's the struggle? I don't, I don't you know, relate to the struggle of, like writers have writer's blocks, painters have painting blocks, but how long will one perpetuate that story into the universe until it becomes clearly true. And that's where I was talking about, I manifest so quickly, I have to really be on my game to not go down a slippery slope. So, so Jackie, how do you do that? Say, say you're, you're noticing that your mind has been uh, a negative or slippery slope, let's just say for the last week or two, how do you go about shifting that? 
personally? Well, I never let it be a week or two. That That's the first thing. Um, you've got it. So um, I believe it's Louise Hay or Esther Hicks. Esther Hicks. She says, you know, anything you give more than 14 seconds to, you're giving it momentum. And she uses the analogy of the car on the top of the hill in San Francisco, loses its brakes in the first, like, five seconds you could probably just like stop the car from going down the hill if you get out of the car and stop it but if after you know 14 seconds that 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 car is going to the bottom of the hill you can't do anything about it at that point it's got no break that's the same thing with stories um so i really try to catch myself in fact right before this interview i saw something that affects my business that was it's kind of disturbing to me and then I but I shifted my story and you know we did that two minute little meditation together for a minute there Uh and I thought you know be present with Chris Miller the whole time because this is is better for me than to text the person who you know didn't meet my expectations, let's say. And of course, not meeting one's expectations is a setup for resentment. I can live in resentment or I can live in, you know, abundance and open to hearing what's going on. And and maybe my story isn't the whole picture. And it frees me from being this lifelong perfectionist that um, doesn't want to live in the gray, you know, and, 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 and that I, I get to experience myself being uncomfortable and letting it pass. So to your question, if I'm in it for more than an hour, I reach out to the people who I consider my support system. And, and I, I, I share it. And when you share it, it's, you can dissolve of a lot of the, um, the story that your mind is telling you, like it, it doesn't have to, um, sharing it halves the pain basically. And then, um, hearing another person's view of how to handle it which I need often because, you know, what they used to say is like alone in your mind, you're in a bad neighborhood. So it's best to, you know, have, if, if, if you're an artist without support, then find support, even if it's from other artists, because like what I do is I introduce all my artists and now like they, they know they're a team with me and like you coming out to show in my gallery, you'll, you'll meet other artists, you'll, you'll make new connections. And anyone that I show, if we're not on the same um, wavelength, no matter how much I like their work, I won't show them because it's not worth it to me. There's so many creative people and there's so many wonderful people. And if I'm not feeling that way about the person, I, I, can't, I can't sell their work. Well, so what I heard there originally was um, to, I, I've had a friend, in fact, Willine Dunn, the same woman I mentioned earlier, mentioned this to me. And she said that you should have a personal cheerleader or cheerleaders yep. that surround you. And so you're talking about make sure that as an artist, you have other people around you that keep you um, conscious, keep you aware of the language you're using, of the story you're telling, and the people that you could just go to and say, hey, I'm a little pulled out of my uh, center right now. Help me get back in, or at least talk it out, like you were saying, right? Uh, well, you know what? Yeah, I love that you just use that term cheerleader because, like, I have a couple of buddies that um, are artists, and we're we're not like in touch with each other to ask, "Do you like this piece?" Because we we don't we don't we're not at that. That's not who we are. We it's you know we don't need to ask each other, "Do you like this piece?" It's it's um, more like I'm having a hard time today. This is what happened, right? It's a support. It's an emotional support, not you know. And then for art support, I have some mentors that I run things by. 
you know, uh, people who have been in the industry for many, many years in, in you know, uh, the million dollar art salespeople, uh, gallerists that will say to me, you know, things that are so important, like never show work that doesn't bring the next person up because like if they're hanging next to each other, they want to both bring each other up. Huh. You, you see, it, 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 as opposed to having work that's just okay. I don't have work that's just okay. I have work that I can't, we can't paint fast enough, my artists and I. You know, we, we um, so we support each other also, not only emotionally and spiritually, but being the cheerleader for each other, um, I mostly find that, well, after I do my workshops at these venues, I walk around to all the booths so that I can meet everyone and they can see me and know me and, um, and I can help them curate if it's not looking the, the best. And so I pick up a lot of artists like this last show in New York, I picked up um, two new artists that are just fantastic. And, and you know, I ended up, uh, I'm gonna show them this summer in the, on the Cape and I met you at my show in Dallas. And um, uh, so like, you never know, like these people, they get a solo booth and they want someone like me to, want their work in their gallery, in, in my gallery. And, and so that's why the investment of paying for a wall in a gallery in, in an art fair is beneficial to a business plan. Like if I show here for, you know, it's gonna cost me $8,000 with hotel and dog sitter and, uh, you know, a booth, and maybe someone to help me set up, right? The van or something. Right. And then I go home with $17,000 from a small booth. Like I've made a wise investment. And from there, I said, I wanna do workshops for your art fairs. And I sent them a proposal and a layout and I started doing art fairs. So my story wasn't written before this all happened. My story was I was in pain, go on a trip with my kid, come home and try something that triggered an old memory. Wow, this feels good. I'm feeling less pain. Oh, I'm in pain again. Paint some more, have a show, sell your work. And then and it and it and then it just like snowballed into. I get two phone calls a day from artists that I've never that I shook their hand at the last art fair that they want me to show them, and and so. You know I know I've said a lot, but spinning back to cheerleaders, these people you ne I never know who my cheerleader is going to be. And I never know who. I'm going to be their cheerleader. I want to be everyone's cheerleader, but it also has to be authentic. It's if I don't like someone's work, I can't be their cheer. I'm the wrong person. And I don't feel bad about that. What I feel is there's someone for every, everyone will find their cheerleader or support or some people whose work I don't like, actually they, they sell and I'm, I'm happy for them. It's just not my art. It's just not my thing and that's okay. Not everyone loves my art and that's okay. It's surprising to me, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you know, I, I wanna go back to something you said or let's clarify it because I'm interested here. Um, I've been, the last few episodes of the podcast, we've talked about emotions and uh, they, I, believe, I believe that emotions are a tool just like a brush in your toolbox and you can use them um, a recent interview actually said that he feels that sometimes it's about going beyond your emotion or choosing the right emotion. So you, you mentioned uh, that you were in such pain. Um, do you think that you use that as a motivator or do you think you actually painted some pain into your work? How do you, how would you describe that? You know, great question because what it really 
brings home for me is this. Had I not been in that amount of pain, I would have never gotten to painting. I needed every experience that I went through five years ago to become the person I am today. And with becoming that person is I'm a well-known painter and and that's how I walk the earth, that I'm a well-known painter, also a well-known TV creator, a series, you know, and it's, and people are like, oh, where, when, when, where can I watch it? I'm like, I can't tell you. What, when can I see it? I can't tell you. <laughs> What's it about? I can't tell you. And that's all because none of that matters, but it's, it's, it's happening. It's, ha I know it. It's happen. It's all happening because we do. We've done the work. So and, you had, and obviously you had pain. I mean, it, this was all started by a, a, what Esther Hicks would say is contrast. You had, yes. had a, a contrasting experience, and you used that experience to to move ahead. Well, you know, you know, Chris, I, I was going along my life with thinking I was at this higher conscious level. And, and I wasn't, I wasn't because I had not experienced pain that an adult my age needed to allow themselves to experience. And because I was limiting, you know, my, um, I was protecting myself. I was, I was guarded and, and, um, uh, you know, I, I would call it, I had bondage of self and, Ooh, I love that. and, and I still do. We all do. Everyone does it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you wouldn't be human without your personal fears of anything, you know, we have to have fears for some reason that uh, part of humanness. And so when I was devastated the way I was five years ago, the pain was unbearable and some people might have committed suicide with the level of pain that I was at and it wasn't physical pain it was emotional and um and I understand why some people who don't have tools might take the suicide route but that wasn't my journey my journey was um you know, trust the process. I had, I have, and had very good support in place to be able to navigate it. And sometimes it was just a friend saying, "I hear you. I get it. I'm here for you," because listening is love. Tuck Nan Han talks about, you know, true love is listening, and that's one of my things that I've been working on to listen to my inner self and listen to what people are saying and um and not not saying about me but talking to me about what are what because in the first five minutes people will tell you who they are if I would just listen otherwise I end up in situations like we all might uh that aren't the best for us but there's something to be learned by them. And so I have to tell you that I'm grateful I was in that much pain because it opened my eyes wider. I, I just, my, I, I'm, I was like, you know, when you're coasting through life, anything coasting is going downhill. So I'm not coasting anymore. I'm um, a willing participant in having had the experience of going through that pain I am, I know that now I'm not going to die from that kind of pain. I don't, I, you know, as a kid, I was always afraid of having deep feelings, falling in love or losing a pet, like things like that were just devastating. And so I avoided them, not knowing I was avoiding them. I just was never like completely present. I couldn't be because of my level of consciousness was not what it is today and today it might be very 
minor to someone else, but for me, I feel like I'm contributing to the world in a way I wasn't able to before that pain. So um, what, what, what I think of when you say that is uh, I've always heard that this phrase, uh, feel the fear and do it anyway. Uh, yeah. But, but I almost think it's some, sort of like feel the pain. Sometimes it's an issue of feel the pain, but do it anyway. Because we, so we have to walk through those emotions. And you were mentioning earlier how, and we all do this, we, we can hold that away or try to avoid it, try to avoiding un uncomfortable situations or something that we don't want to deal with. But an artist, a spiritual artist, has to learn to walk through it. And it's not fun. <laughs> it's not always fun, right? But it is moving you ahead. And I love that analogy of saying, instead of coasting, you know, which is going downhill, I love when you said that, it's, it's, it's propelling yourself upward. You know. you know, what's interesting, too, is I just remembered when when I was in that much pain, Tuck Nhat Hanh talks has a book called uh, True Love. And in the book, it's interesting. OK, so in the book, it says, um, you know, embrace your pain as as a mother would embrace the baby crying, uh -huh. a crying baby. And and so and I just got a rush of chills through my body. What I did was that every night when I was in all that pain, I would you know, look, painting didn't like dissolve the pain. I would still, I go to sleep. I'm still in pain. I wake up. I'm, you know, you have to eat. You have to walk the dog, take care of my child, uh, you know, clean the house, do the laundry. You've got to do all that with your pain as opposed to not doing anything. And so when Tuck Nhat Hanh said, you know, treat your pain as a baby and I'm a mom and I know what it's like to hold my baby when she was crying, I visualized my pillow with the word pain on it, like a uh, text. And I would bring the pillow close to me as if I'm carrying a baby in my bed. And, and, and that's how I would visualize bringing the pain in. And then I would, you know, do affirmations that, um, you know, this too shall pass. And it's okay, you're okay. And actually learning to self-soothe my damaged inner child, you know? It, it, it's like ignoring her doesn't help her know that she is loved. And she, like me, I'm a healthy adult. I, I, I feel good. Um, I'm not upset. I'm not um, in pain today. But sometimes the inner child or angry teenager is there wanting me to respond a certain way, wanting me to um, say things that are not the nicest way to be. And I still do this. And, and look, I've been practicing this for uh, 37 years now, maybe longer, where um, you know I have these tools. And so um, when, my, when my anger comes up, I, I, I I, I self-soothe myself, not by anything external, by positive talk. Because, uh, you know, in the five languages of love, there's, there's five ways to express love. One is physical attention. Two is positive words of affirmation and kindness. Mm -hmm. The cheerleader you talked about. Three are, you know, um, intimacy. Four is uh, gifts and, uh, you know, physical gifts and five is time. And I always say this to anyone that I'm doing my spiel to is, you know, time is all we really have for each other. And how much am I spending on wasting it? Because there's real time's not real and neither is, you know, like this, we're here for such a brief period. And um, it's a blink of an eye a lifetime because I swear to God, I look in the mirror. I'm like, I can't believe I'm this age because I still, I feel like a matured 40 year old and I'm, I'm not, but, but, you know, because I don't look 40 anymore and um, it doesn't matter to me. What matters is that I'm nurturing and healing myself on a daily basis 
not everyone who's born into this particular lifetime is going to be the artist uh, of all artists. And, and that's not even most of our goals. You know, like I don't need to be a Picasso. I'd like to be a Basquiat that lives. I also, one of my stories is that I will be even more well-known before I die. I don't, I'm hoping that I don't have to be dead for people to get what an impact my work has done in the art world. And so um, the, the healing, the pain was not, even though it was a current situation, it was definitely old wounds that needed a lifetime of acknowledgement and care by me, the adult. How can one not spin for a week in their upset? They have to realize it's a choice. They get to spin or they don't have to spin. They get to seek tools to help heal you, whatever that is. And, and you know, my work is, is, is deeper. Like I say, you know, it comes through me. Mm -hmm. And I've always been an artist, but my, my clay work, which was fun and beautiful, I had so much fun doing it, but it wasn't meant to be shared with the world because it wasn't it, it it just you know clay is hard to get it was never my intention I was busy in my hair salons so now my intentions are keep creating keep showing keep selling you know and help artists along the way I mentor artists I I uh and and help guide them and people I show you know I I price their art for them most of them I tell them what direction I think would be better because I want all my artists to have signature work, not like to walk into a room and, and see 20 different pieces of art and the same artist did it. And I can't tell that that yeah. that's a problem. I, I love your work because it's, it's very original and it's you and, and why, why I think our, our challenge as artists is to bring that creative DNA to our craft. And, and always make sure that we're we're expressing what's unique to us, you know. Um, yes. So what, as we wind this uh, interview down, I, I wanted to ask you, since you do a lot of mentoring and you, you own a gallery, so you have the experience on that side, what do you think um, is the most important thing a, a, an artist should know before they enter the business? Well, a couple of things. One thing they should understand is they should know if they're into the business part of it or not? Like, you know, are they someone who is interested in selling their work? Are they interested in just painting? Or do they want someone who is going to, um, you know, be their business manager and gallerist? Because it's separate things. Like, um, and also, it does your work show, like, are all the pieces, is there a thread? between all the work that you're showing. Like um, my college professor, uh, I, w I worked in his office for my um, last year of uh, school. And, and I said to him, and we were returning the portfolios that did not get accepted to the program. And I said to him, why, why aren't these accepted? What, what's going on? And he, he paused and he, he took out the pieces of the portfolio that were in there. And he said, well, you see how this person's very creative, but I can't tell that this is one artist. There's a photo in here, there's a painting, there's a collage, there's an etching, there's a print, there's, you know, this sculpture. Like it's all over the place, which it's great that the person's creative, but that doesn't create, you, you can't get into art school. Um, it, it, well, the school I went to, there's a lot of schools that will just take a creative person, but this particular dean of the school, <clears throat> of the program, wanted to see a definite fingerprint of like, oh, this is Chris. Mm. This is Chris Miller's work. Like when you walk into any, like wherever my work shows now, people are like, oh my God, I saw this in Miami. Were you in Miami? I'm like, yeah, I was in Miami. Oh, I bought from you in Provincetown and I'm and, and in Palm Springs. So people 
recognize my work because no one's doing what I'm doing. I'm not doing photorealism. I'm not trying to make a Modigliani. I'm, I'm doing a play on Modigliani and I'm doing a play on designer labels and I'm doing a play on, um, you know, uh, fashion. So that combination is unique. It's my fingerprint. And because I became well known from that, now I can do these dog sculptures that I do. I do good dog, bad dog, Buddha dog. <laughs> and they, they, you know, I can't make those quick enough because people love them. And, and so it's okay for me to now have an offshoot of what I'm doing. So back to your point of your question, what can I tell artists? Find your voice, your fingerprint, and make a body of work and run it by other artists. Because if you're not sure, then, like I was perfectly clear with my work. If, if I never doubt in my mind that this stuff that I started doing wasn't gonna be successful. Like I, and, and I didn't go into it to be successful. It was like my first show, people were like, oh my God, this is so unique. And now people look for me at the art fairs and they call me and they text me and they email me and, and they want me to show them because the first night at my show, I had 19 red dots on 19 pieces. So if you're not, and if you're thinking to yourself, if you're an artist thinking to yourself, oh, it's never gonna be me, well, then that's your story. Or, yeah. Wow, I would love, I and, and don't love for it to be you. Make a decision that that's going to be me and go forward because there's so much talent out there and fear is the thing that stops people from exposing what they're doing. So it goes back to that. Um, I love that because it's we receive what we believe. And so knowing your story and being clear on your story, I mean, very clear to the point of really believing it, knowing it it's beyond belief it's knowing that you knew that's right that your paintings had a had a message and a voice and you knew that they would be well received and so that's very important all that um understanding exactly who you are what your story is what your your creative dna is what your thumbprint is your voice the same word for all the same things it, absolutely chris when I, when i walk through my studio when I had all my work hanging here in the studio before the gallery or the show, I, I walk around and I think, oh my God, I did that? Like I, and, and it's not like, hey, I did that. It's, wow, look what I'm allowing to come through me in this lifetime. That's how I look at it. Like, wow, uh, it, th this is the miracle of pain because without that pain, I wouldn't have been painting. I would have been, not creating because I was stagnant. And, uh, and here's this body of work. I've sold over 400 pieces in the last uh, four years. And um, I tell you, I only have probably 0.2% of what I haven't sold. It's because I don't show it anymore. Like my early works, I don't show. And if you don't notice that you're growing in your talent and passion then you got to shift it up because if you're not developing as an artist whether you're and i'm not talking about going to classes going to classes is great learn something new but if you're not in your studio if you're not prolific and you're not in your studio um how can you have it um get bigger if you're not letting it get big come through you it, it and 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 better it 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 just gets better and better for me um i do, i don't uh it's never a waste of time to to be creative and 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 i would suggest not talking to yourself if your voice is not one of cheerleading yourself well, Jackie, this has been a great interview. There's there's a lot more, obviously, I think like we've talked before, we could go on and on and on because there's so many different things <laughs> that you give me to think about, which is great. Thank um, you. 
I want to thank you for 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 being on the show, and um, I look forward to seeing your gallery this summer. And and uh, I'm I will be up there at the end of June, and I also will be presenting my book, which is is exciting. Um, I love talking about these concepts. I love talking about how to be a spiritual artist. And obviously, Jackie and I have so many overlapping experiences. Um, there's a lot of commonality here. Thanks again for being on the show. Is there any any one thing you'd like to leave us with that I haven't asked? I just want to say that I think it's terrific that you bring these um, podcasts to other artists and other listeners. And um, your mission is the same as mine. Like, let's help the art. Let's come together as a community of artists that support each other. And um, I always said this um, when I had hair salons, I used to do art shows and auctions and fundraisers and uh, bring people together. I'm a connector and um, I always believe that, you know, Warhol and Bowie and, and Basquiat and like all those people that had salon atmospheres were they were exchanging art ideas so i so the last thing i guess is is if you're in a community of artists do salon style gatherings make a meal with each other sit around and talk about what you're working on get ideas and and tell each other the truth you know as honestly and as um considerate as you can be to give input into what your fellow artists are doing, it's always helpful. It's always helpful. And, and uh, honesty, as opposed to um, not saying anything, I think it can go a long way if the person is available to hear feedback from another professional artist. And if you're not a professional artist yet, and you wanna be, change your story. I love that. I love it. Just definitely change your story. Surround yourself by a community of support, your cheerleaders, and, and use the right story. So thanks again, Jackie. I look forward to um, having you in my community. <laughs> yeah, same and, here, Chris. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you for listening to the Spiritual Artist Podcast. Whether you're following the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, Make sure you choose the subscribe button so you'll receive new segments when they're released. Plus, check out my new book, The Spiritual Artist, now available on Amazon.com. In the meantime, be still, listen, and know that you are a spiritual artist.